Hello and welcome to this session on Valuing Heritage, Concepts and Methods. My name is Lim Yok Mui and I lecture at the School of Housing, Building and Planning, University Science Malaysia, Penang. I am a quantity surveyor by training, but my interest is in heritage. My research journey started when I was part of a team that studied heritage properties value in Georgetown. And as Georgetown World Heritage Site is just in our backyard, this provided me with the opportunity to further research on heritage issues throughout the years. Through my research, I have developed a framework for the preparation of costing document for heritage properties. If you would like to know more, you can email me at ymlim at usm.ny. Now, let's get started. This session will be divided into two parts. In the first part, I will explain the concept of value in the context of heritage. As the product of heritage is unique and different from the usual product that we know of, we have to first understand how value is seen in the framework for heritage. And in the second part, I will describe the methods that are commonly used to estimate value for heritage product. The heritage that I meant here pertains to cultural heritage. So, when I mention heritage, it can be a monument of architectural works, a painting, an archaeological structure, cave dwellings, or a combination of such. It can also mean a group of buildings or sites with outstanding universal value. From the above definition, you can see that heritage product is diverse and unique. And so, before we calculate the value of heritage product, let's determine the type of product that heritage falls into. Comparing heritage product to others, we know that heritage has non-excludable characteristics. This means that it is impossible or very costly to exclude others from enjoying the particular heritage product. For example, it is very difficult to exclude visitors to a World Heritage Site. It is also impossible to stop people from appreciating the beauty of a heritage building, for example, like the Cologne Cathedral. We may control people from entering by charging a fee, but we cannot stop them from looking at the external facade. Similarly, we cannot stop people from visiting heritage landscape sites such as uh, Shirakawa Go in Japan. The second characteristic of heritage product is non-rival. This means that two or more people can enjoy the heritage product without interfering or preventing each other from enjoying the same. For example, a heritage a statue in a park can be enjoyed by more than one person at the same time. The same goes for painting or visiting a heritage site. However, the non-rival situation can change when there are too many people enjoying the heritage product and causes interference in other people's enjoyment. Then, the heritage product takes on the congestible characteristic. Congestible means when the use of a product by an additional person diminishes the enjoyment by another person. So, for example, a big crowd in a heritage building, such as the Blue Mansion in Penang, will lessen the enjoyment of the visitors to the said building. Similarly, too many people viewing the Mona Lisa painting will make it hard for the visitors to appreciate the painting. When such situation happens, this causes the characteristic to change from non-rival to rival. 
usually one method to limit the people visiting or using the heritage product is to charge a fee. So when there is a fee involved, this causes the heritage product to change from non-excludable to excludable. For example, by charging a fee to view the Mona Lisa painting, the museum can exclude people that cannot afford to pay or not willing to pay to enjoy the painting. As you can see, the characteristics of non-excludable and non-rival of heritage product is the same as the characteristics of public good. And so, heritage product will behave similarly as public good. I am sure that you now understand why it is difficult to persuade the private sector to provide heritage products and uh, why the government are always asked to intervene. Alright, now that we know um, how the characteristic of a heritage product is, let's get back to valuing heritage. You may wonder why we should even attempt to value heritage product when it is obvious that protecting heritage is so important. Well, different groups of people perceive heritage differently. For the pro-conservation group, they will insist that we must conserve at all costs. While for those that do not find conservation important, will insist that funding be spent on other utilities that are important to them. As you are aware, preserving Restoring and maintaining cultural heritage requires financial resources and I'm sure you will agree that financial resources are very limited. So in such a situation where the resources are limited, how do we decide who should be responsible to protect heritage? Is it the government or the people or should the heritage product be self-sustaining? When we need to address such issues, information on the value of the heritage can be used to assist in deciding which heritage to protect and how much resources should be spent in protecting it. Another reason for valuing heritage is when we want to know what the optimum amount of heritage product is. To answer that question, we need to calculate the cost of protecting the heritage product and compare it with the benefit obtained from the same heritage product. When the ratio of cost-benefit equals 1, this means we have reached an optimum number where the cost is equivalent to the benefit in protecting the X number of heritage products. Cost would refer to the amount that is needed to preserve the heritage, the restoration cost, the maintenance cost, as well as the running cost. We can obtain such costs from the construction professionals and the operators of the heritage product. Benefit would refer to the revenue or enjoyment generated by the heritage. We call this the value generated by the heritage product. While cost is easily obtained, the value generated by the heritage product is difficult to quantify. Several methods are used to estimate the heritage value, but there is still insufficient research conducted to identify one best method. Before we learn about the methods, we will first discuss about the definition of value in the context of heritage. Heritage value can be broadly divided into tangible and intangible value. Tangible value is shown as monetary form and intangible value are in non-monetary form. Intangible value can be in the form of a historical, social or cultural value. In order to capture both the tangible and intangible value, the concept of total economic value, TEV, is used. 
Total economic value, TEV, includes the benefits that heritage creates from using the heritage directly, which is called used value. And also the benefits derived from, the, from not using it, which is called the non-use value. Let us now look at both use and non-use value in more detail. Use value can be divided into direct value, indirect value, and option value. The first category of use value is direct value, which occurs when the user benefits from direct consumption of the heritage product. For example, purchasing traditional crafted trinkets, aesthetic view, and experiencing a stay in a heritage house. This value can be translated as the largest amount that a person is willing to pay to obtain the heritage product directly. The second is indirect value, which is created by the benefits from secondary goods and services. For example, Heritage Garden provides indirect benefits such as improved health to the users. This value can be translated as the savings in healthcare due to improved health. The third option is um, option value. Option value is the value people put on having the opportunity to keep the possibility to enjoy the heritage in the future, even though it is not used today. This value can be translated as the amount that a person is willing to pay to ensure that the heritage product is preserved to provide the possibility to visit it in the future. Now, let's look at the non-use value. Non-use value is also divided into three categories which are bequest value, altruistic value and existence value. Bequest value is the value people put on keeping the heritage product for the coming generations. This value can be translated as the amount that a person is willing to pay to ensure that the heritage product is preserved so that the coming generations are able to continue to enjoy the heritage. The second category is altruistic value which is the value people put on the heritage product that is available for the pleasure of others. This value can be translated as the amount that a person is willing to pay to ensure that the heritage product is preserved so that others can continue to enjoy the heritage. And thirdly, existing existence value is the value people put on the pure existence of a heritage product even though they never use it or think that they will in the future. This value can be translated as the amount that a person is willing to pay just for the heritage product to continue to exist. For example, preserving heritage artifacts that are very fragile which will not be put out for viewing by the public. So, although the people could not enjoy the heritage product, but people are willing to pay for its existence. From the examples given, the guiding principle in defining value in the context of heritage is that value is the largest amount of money that a person would be willing to pay to enable the heritage product to be enjoyed either personally or by others. Now that we understand the concept of value in the context of heritage, let's look at the methods used in calculating the value. Each method aims to calculate the total economic value of a heritage product. I will introduce four popular methods which are the cost-benefit analysis method, contingent valuation method, travel cost method and hedonic regression model method and followed by two other less popular methods. The first method is the cost-benefit analysis method. This method 
measures cost and benefits of alternative scenarios, investment plans, or development programs. It can provide monetary estimates of value to heritage. We use this method uh, when we need to estimate the aggregate net benefit from using the heritage product and compare it with the cost of providing the heritage product. Here is an article you can refer to learn more and also an example of how the benefits are shown. The method compares the benefits and the cost to derive either a net benefit or a net cost. A net cost is when you have negative benefit. The next method is the contingent valuation method. This is a method of estimating the value that a person places on a product and in this case on a heritage product. This method uses a questionnaire survey asking people their willingness to pay for the benefits received from the heritage product or willingness to accept compensation for the loss of the heritage product. Contingent valuation method is mostly used to estimate non-use value. The following article has both examples of cost-benefit and contingent valuation method, while the second article compares contingent valuation method with travel cost method. Here is how the final value is shown in a study where they measure if the value of the experience in concert hall and museum is higher or lower than the entrance fee and the maximum willingness to pay for the experience. Another method is the travel cost method. In this method, we measure the amount that people are prepared to pay in making the journey to visit a heritage product. It may also include recreation fee. This concept uses the amount that the visitor is willing to spend to visit the heritage product. It also uses the time spent for traveling as part of the value. You can see the comparisons between the contingent valuation method and travel cost method in this article. This is how it is shown in the same study. The next method is a method that is suitable to estimate value of property, uh, especially heritage properties. This method is called hedonic regression model. In using this method, heritage buildings or historical site is broken up into constituent characteristics and obtains inferences of the values of each characteristic. The housing price is calculated using econometric model showing the price, how the price would change when the quality of relevant attribute change. This method considers benefits such as water views and building characteristics like age of the buildings, size and architectural style in determining the value. You may refer to the reference below for the detail in calculations. Here is an example of how it looks like. In the example, you can see that different attributes give different values to a property. Other less common methods are the maintenance cost method and difference in difference method. Maintenance cost method is a method that measures the value that people are willing to pay to maintain the heritage product. The data required for this method is the estimated cost to repair the damages to the material of a historical building or monument. The damages may be due to air pollution or water pollution or even noise pollution. For the difference in difference method, it compares the changes in the outcome between two groups. The first group is called the treatment group and the second group is called the comparison group. 
okay? For example, we can use this method to estimate the value from maintaining and utilizing a heritage building. So we call this group the treatment group. And then we compare this with another similar heritage building that is not used at all and without maintenance. We call this group the comparison group. So knowing what you are valuing is important for you to decide which method is suitable. For example, if you are valuing heritage property, then hedonic regression model would be the suitable method. Alright, now let's recap on what we have learned thus far. First, we know that heritage product has non-excludable and non-rival characteristics. But the level of being non-excludable and non-rival varies among the heritage product, especially when it changes into congestible heritage product. Second, this makes the product not attractive to the private sector. Therefore, there is no marketplace to obtain the market value of a heritage product, and it usually would need funding from the government. So, this is where the valuation of heritage product plays an important part in decision making on the allocation of resources, especially between the competing needs of heritage products and other public goods. Due to its public goods characteristic, heritage product could not be valued in the market like other commodity such as retail goods. Its value is derived from the use or enjoyment of heritage product by people who are interested in heritage. Therefore, the concept of value in heritage is more complex and this is how it looks like graphically. So, you can see, value is not just a number for heritage product. It is a combination of tangible and non-tangible value which is called total economic value. And this TEV is further divided into use value and non-use value. Use value can be derived from direct use, indirect use and also the option to use. Meanwhile, the non-use value is derived from bequeathing heritage to future generations from altruistically allowing people to enjoy the heritage and also the value due to the heritage being in existence. And so naturally, the use value is easier to estimate than the non-use value. But there are various researches done using different methods for valuing heritage and from the research, we can determine which method is suitable to estimate the different type of value. Although there is still insufficient study conducted to provide a definitive guide on the methods, at the moment the following methods are found to be relevant. The commonly used methods are cost-benefit analysis, contingent valuation, travel cost and hedonic regression model. While some of the lesser used methods are maintenance cost and difference in difference method. Well, we have now come to the end of the video. Congratulations for completing the session. Thank you for watching and I wish you all the best.